Hi, this is Moby. Welcome to the Fire Show. Hello, hello, hello. Business is risk. Da da da. Dramatic pause. No dramatic pause. And to help you figure out in this mini series about customer validation, that is, if people will pay for your idea before you build it, I'm sitting down with David Altonian, entrepreneur, professor, mentor, advisor. We're going through the whole process of okay. Once you've identified a problem that you think a market has, how do you go about figuring out who should I target, how should I target them, and most importantly, are they going to pay for it? Enjoy. <laughs> do you really want me to tell you? Yes. Uh, so, <laughs> hey, David. Uh, hey, how are you doing, Moby? Why are you tired today? So yesterday was a 16 and a half hour day. First part of the day was spent here on campus doing uh, my academic role as a, a professor uh, for a retreat. And uh, my second half was working at the counter of a ice cream sandwich shop, making ice cream sandwiches and baking cookies from five till midnight last night. Wow. Yeah. Two totally different extremes. Why were you doing that? Well, I'm working with a company in town called Mujo that does ice cream sandwiches that's looking to franchise and expand. And uh, I started helping them um, put their plans together, liked it, and actually have become a partner there. And so I've been in the store to try to really understand the processes and be able to package this thing so that we can uh, take it to other locations and be able to replicate that experience across the country. So the best way to do it is get in there and, and do it. It's, last night was a little more doing than I expected, <laughs> but uh, that's what I was doing. Yeah. So. Five to 12 making ice cream sandwiches. So you kind of, and you mentioned before that no one else was there. So you had to figure everything out. Yeah. So I, you know, when we started doing this, I was spending time. I go in for a couple hours at a time and work with the shifts. So, you know, part of putting this together is you got to create standards of practice so that you can replicate these stores in different locations. And they've got a lot of good documentation because the company has been around for two years and really spent time trying to build this from the ground up to be done this way. And, um, but I still needed to take that and translate that into a standard format that we could use. Um, and also because I eventually expect to get students working on some of the packaging of this as uh, classroom opportunities. And so I needed to get to at least understand where I had of it and, you know, a, a baseline that they could work from. So I've been going in for two or three hours at a time and doing it. And I was learning, but you know, someone would come through and it would be too much for me to handle. I go, to the full timers, hey, uh, this one's yours. I have no idea. And then last night there was nobody there but three of us, and we were all three. It was the main owner of the firm and uh, two others of us that really had no experience. So I would look around, and someone would ask for something really bizarre, and I'd be, like, I have no idea how to do this. And I'd look around, and everybody would just shrug. I was like, okay, I guess I better figure this one out. So I found I am not good at making milkshakes. It's okay. not my specialty. <laughs> I am too impatient to sit yeah. there and grind. But it was a great experience too because I think it you really you can think about the process and what needs to happen. But man, until you're there and you're in your fourth hour and you're trying to you know do something the same way, uh, you don't realize how difficult it is, how important it is. I'll give you a really great example. The uh, scoops need to be fairly standard in size. First of all, for cost containment. Second of all, so that the customers have a similar experience. If one ice cream sandwich is this big, you know, and two hours later, or the person next to them gets one that's this big, you have a problem. Mm -hmm. When you're in the beginning of the day and you start using the scoops and all that, it's really easy to go, yeah, we're going to take time and make sure it's right. By the time you're four or five hours in and you're tired, it's like, I don't care. You can't do that. So you can look and understand here's a problem. This is harder to maintain the quality, harder to do things. How do we fix this? So really going through and having that experience and seeing what people on the line deal with, I, you know, I think it's really invaluable. And it was packed, right? And it was packed. I swear. I thought this was a candid camera exercise. <laughs> I was sure that like the general manager had put cameras in there to film us. 
the way this came about was the the crew wanted to do a team building water park day and uh we agreed that we the partners would actually run the store so they could do that which they thought was great and hilarious at the same time um but i think we held our own i talked to them today and we left the store in good shape no one got killed for me the measure was no one got mad and walked out so yes, that works. Yeah, and the great thing about this business is when people come in they're happy because they're buying ice cream sandwiches and when they leave they're happy because they had an ice cream sandwich yeah. so it's a really great experience so i mean this is a very successful business and you have built successful businesses you've been a partner of businesses and you're a professor of entrepreneurship at a university te teaching this stuff what do you say to people who come to you we have some fair understanding of the problem, but say, okay, I think I want to build this. Um, how do I figure out if people want it? I think it's a great question. I think one of the mistakes that people that want to do a business or create something make is thinking that they're actually the customer. You can make something that's fantastic and great for a market of one, you. Um, and so it's important to really spend time to understand who are the customers. Um, first of all, who are the immediate customers and then who are the ancillary or long-term customers? And then what do those customers really want and what do they need? Um, and, and trying to profile and understand them. Understanding your customer doesn't just mean though what their needs are, you know, from a product standpoint. I consider it understanding the entire persona behind them. And you hear the term buyer persona. And a, a lot of times I'll see buyer personas and, and it's a description of a type of a customer for that type of a product. But in my mind, a buyer persona is much broader and understanding customers are much broader. It's understanding their socioeconomic situation, where they are, where they get information, where they hang out, what their likes and wants are. And so I think successful companies really do a good job of profiling and understanding their primary customers, their immediate customers, and their ancillary or secondary customers. To put a fine point on it, understand, for example, us at Mujo's, we need to understand who the people are coming in. You can go to the top level and go, that's a family, that's a college student. That's... But the family, the, the person in that family, is going that is the buyer is going to get information and be um, encouraged to go to the store very differently from the college student mm -hmm. the influencers are different the where they get information is different their economic decision making and purchase power is different and you have to understand all those you can't just put a graphic up with showing a you know a family and go this is for families you have to understand where they are where they hang out what they care about who actually is the customer. In the case of a family, it's the kid, mm -hmm. you know, and the, the buyer is the father or the mother. And in the case of a college student, the buyer and the customer are the same person. So before anything is done, I always view the most important thing is really understanding who those customers are and then trying to get a sense of um, you know, the, the profile and the life of those customers. So when you have an idea and you're thinking about your customers. So for example, Mujo is at the like right in front at, of the University of Texas right. in Austin. And when you say you're going to make ice cream sandwiches, right? Do you think about the fact that okay, I have like what's a better approach saying, okay, I have these five kinds of people, families, single people, um college students, teens who can buy ice cream? who will buy from this place. That's when we'll place our store at the university. Versus saying, okay, I'm gonna make an ice cream sandwich store at the university and these are the people which will be there. You know, both of those are valid ways to do it. I think, again, the economics may drive some of the decision. You know, if it's the first one, which is, here's the type of a buyer that I have. And so I'm gonna place a location where the buyer is is a very valid approach to go. Uh, you know, for example, if you see a, a sporting facility, sporting goods shop, they tend to be around schools and places where parents are going to buy sporting goods. Putting them, you know, in an industrial area doesn't make any sense. On the other hand, you can take a concept and say, I think this concept is fairly generic. I don't know where the what the specific customers are for here. So I'm going to go in and I'm going to test in that spot and then figure out the persona of who's really coming in. 
Starbucks is a great example of that, or a, a coffee store. You know everybody's going to drink coffee, but you don't necessarily know by area what the persona of who's really going to come in. But I think it's a safe bet you can get to a baseline for a while and then build up. You know, my personal opinion is that's a much more riskier approach than going off and do the other one. But you see it happen, and I think both can be successful. And in some cases, the more you are on the edge with a new product, uh, which means more experimental it is, or the more there's unknowns where you can't look at buyers from before, the more you have to do that kind of thing. And when we talk about test marketing, that's where you can test market, put it in, find out who it's responding, you know, who's responding well, and then build around that. So, you know, both of those are valid ways to do it, but they have different approaches to how do you maximize it. So I could potentially say that for this product that I want to build, there are three potential markets. I believe, and then this comes into the part where I don't think my idea is the best thing ever. And I kind of say that I have this assumption, not belief, that this market needs it more. One out of the three markets that I think needs it more. And then I go in and test it. Yes. Yeah. Well, and this is where, you know, lean startups are a very popular thing. The idea of true lean startup of, you know, going in and starting something and pivoting, pivoting doesn't really work for something like Mujo. But there is a version of this where if you know that there's an area, but you don't really understand the demog demographics, you don't know if they're going to like the product, then you figure ways to test it inexpensively. Whether that's you do a pop-up store, you do a relationship with an existing vendor that uh, or store that you can actually test your product in. And if it goes well, then you decide to invest more. Um, those are all valid ways to do it. But what you'll see, and you've seen this happen before, is someone will have a concept, not know if it works, but I'm gonna go ahead and invest and build out a whole new space. And then nobody shows up. Six months later, they're gone. Well, there probably was an interim step to test that market first. In my mind, that's a failure of market validation. If you go and you spend that kind of money and you put in a product or a service or a business, and six months to a year later, you're out of there because there's been not enough takers, that's a market validation problem. Mm -hmm. And that's pretty a pretty good indication. You should have spent less money and validated it. And you're going to be more successful at the end of it. Yeah, absolutely. You know, you put a lot of effort in to put these things in. I don't care whether you're doing this, even for software, you know, you put a lot of money in and effort to get a product to market. So instead of having this supposition in your mind of my view of what customers want is the right thing. So we're going to build this whole product out and then deliver it. If you can do small versions of it, it works. The word people like to use is experiments. You know, we can talk about experimenting with uh, Lean Startup for software. It's very easy. I'm going to do a minimum viable product, put it out there, and then, you know, iterate off it. And once we get a model that works, we'll go off and accelerate it. But you can do that kind of experimentation with even a retail business. Again, pop-up stores. In our case, we have pop-up vans. We have vans that go around and do events. And we can tell by different locations in the city which events are giving us the best revenue. There's other outlier, there's other um, factors that may drive it. You know, for example, if we're in central Austin, it happens to be because we're at a fair or a festival, maybe the volume's higher because of the fair and festival, not there. But if you've done it a few times, you'll get an indication of how does that location bear compared to another location in the city. And it doesn't cost you anything. You drive a van there, it's, you know, a few hours of someone's time. And that is so much cheaper than going off and going through the headache of building a location and hoping that you know you're going to be able to pivot or find the right buyer persona that works that's a crazy even if i can't tell exactly in a location what those buyers are while i'm doing my experiments i at least know there's a baseline of business there that will support the business i really like those examples because i can see analogies everywhere like in the physical space online because you said something like um, partner up with someone. I mean, if you have someone who has a 10,000 person email list in your market, you can ask them, Hey, can you put a blurb out and see what the, if someone bites? Yeah. Or you could go to, if you think your market is 25 to 40 year old tech uh, people, then you go to a trade show and you spend 300 bucks on the booth and then you spend 200 bucks on promotion or whatever. 
You just talk to like 300 people in a day and figure out, is this something people want? I think that's the right way to go do it. Yeah, and to that point, I'm actually a huge fan of trying to go where the critical masses are. So um, your thing about trade shows is a great example. How do you define a critical mass? Like? Enough, you know, enough. a group of people, enough that you have a sample size that's meaningful. So uh, go back to your trade show, and I'll go back to Motion, which was my business, or Dell, we did this a lot. But motions are probably the better one. We knew we wanted to get into healthcare. We could have run around with our product and talked to doctors, offices, and hospitals for a year and collected data. But we went to HIMSS, which was laser, uh, the large healthcare um, information management conference, largest one in the country. And in two days, we could get to hundreds of healthcare professionals. And not only the users of the healthcare technology are walking around, but actually the buyers and decision makers. So for $10,000 or $20,000, even if it was that much money, for a week of time, we could collect as much data as we needed. The, the opportunity costs of being able to do that versus the actual time and dollar cost of going around for a year, or the risk cost of doing for a year of onesie twosies, and not getting that critical mass information, it's so much more uh, cost effective to go to those events. And I feel the same way about the fairs and things like this. For this, you can really get a sense when you've got a lot of people coming through, what's going on here, you know, is this a valid you know, market for us? That definition of critical mass, that kind of goes back to what you said in the start, which is know your customer yeah. so well, because otherwise you'll think that you're making a product and you go to a general, place where there's a lot of different buyer personas and uh, you might not get any hits or you might get too many and you don't understand which buyer persona am I selling to. Yeah, I agree with that. Now, let me give you a tip that I've learned painfully. And as you were saying this, it really struck with me. You can actually waste your time in those critical mass environments if you don't have some set questions that you want to validate or invalidate uh, immediately. So I'll give, you, I'll give you an example from class. If I want to know how a class is really doing, how that's performing, how you know how well they're they're receiving the the course, I could go talk to the class as a group, and you know what will happen. I'll say, hey, how's it going? What's working? What's not? And what do you think is likely going to happen if I do that? This is great. It's a little hard, but it's great. I'll get that. That's probably well, and I'll get that for my positive students. Yeah. Or I will get nothing. Right? They'll all look at me like I'm not speaking up. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. But if I go talk individually to a couple of them, tell me what's working, what's not. No, you know, I just want to know. I really need to know from you. I'll get maybe one or two things. Well, you know, I think the homework's too hard, or, you know, I just don't think everybody's participating. And I take those and I go back in the classroom and I go, I'd like to know: Is my homework too hard? You're going to get a different set of answers. People will actually respond to that specific question, or, you know, do I need to do something different to make sure everybody? participates is something missing from my direction you'll get feedback because they're responding to something that resonates and something that's specific as opposed to tell me what you think so what we try to do like when i would go to trade shows and we do focus groups there we would do some individual interviews first of all and try to get a set of uh, of questions that we're not sure about you know things like are they really going to be willing to pay this kind of a price is the purchase, a great example with healthcare, does it really take six months to get approval for purchases? Those are things we wanna know. If you just ask, you know, tell us about tablets and about hardware and, you know, and about uh, electronic medical record systems, we would have heard about software, we would have heard about all kinds of things, about how hard it is to get the doctors, which wouldn't have affected my business at all. What really would have affected my business is what the single customer told me of, you know, it takes me six months to get an approval. How long does it take you guys to get approval in a focus group when you've got critical mass? You'll get good answers, mm -hmm. which is a much more uh, directed, targeted way to do this. And, and actually, I use this even in my own personal stuff. I'll ask people individually to just get a sense and try to go understand what the critical questions are that I need validation on. And then you use this bigger critical mass group to try to suss out. And even if you're not doing focus groups, if you're at the trade show and you're walking and talking to 20 people in one day, you can ask all 20 people the same questions. Mm -hmm. You will get a theme as opposed to asking one person this week, going to another customer the next week, another customer. By the end of the 20 weeks, you don't know as much as what you did in the one day talking to 20 people. So I'm a big fan of wherever you can get to critical mass for doing that. So the tactic is to start off by 
understanding that you will get qualitative information and uh, after talking to a few people, then test the assumptions that you built from that qualitative information and go towards quantified? Yes, yeah, I think that's a good way. Yeah, actually, in research, we call that mixed methods. You use the qualitative method to uh, suss out the things you need to measure and test, and then you create the surveys to actually be able to do the, the quantitative mm -hmm. analysis and do regressions to find out for your dependent variable which thing is the most impactful. But even to get the things to put on there, you really need a qualitative assessment in the first. But realize that both of these, what I'm talking about, is still qualitative. But what you're doing is you're going from a single point uh, you know, input to you know mass input. You're getting lots of data points together um, so that your sample size is much, much bigger and it's much more unified together. Because even if you decided, let's go back to our 20, my 20 data points spread over 20 weeks is not as efficient or um, even I think valid as the 20 in the same day. Because over 20 weeks of getting one at a time, things are happening and in their lives and what they're doing. But if you got the 20 people at the trade show, they're kind of in the same area. So all of the, uh, uh, all of the things that may bias the, the input are, are kind of deadened by that critical mass. You know, again, I'll go back to the fair example. If I went and asked people, you know, over five weeks, what they thought about ice cream sandwiches, you're going to get, depending on the weather of the day, mm -hmm. how much money they have, are the kids driving them crazy? But if I'm at the festival and I'm surveying and asking them as they're walking around the festival, they're all there having a good time. This is the same weather. It's the same experience. They've got the same choices of alternatives. Even if I want to figure out a product compared to competition, why'd you go buy that one and not this one? You've got an environment that's almost like a laboratory environment that you can use. So I'm a big fan of doing that mm -hmm. and going where the, you know, where the critical mass is. To find the communities of people who care about um, the things you do or have the problems that yeah. you think you want to solve. Where they're really focusing on what it is you know, that, that environment that you're, you're talking about. I mean, if you're at a fair, people are there to have fun. They're going to ask about fun food, you know? Yeah. Um, if you're doing the healthcare product that we were, you have people there to buy healthcare products. They, you're talking to them while they're also thinking of other purchases that does bias the decisions and their feedback, but it biases in a way that you want to know. They're not going to tell you what you want to hear. They're going to tell you based on their perceptions of what else they're looking at. And I think those are really healthy ways to collect data. So you have a idea for a product or service, regardless of what industry it is, and you're testing it out. How does a founder detach themselves from the idea and be able to take feedback, especially when the feedback is wonderful, when it's like honest and saying, hey, this isn't a great idea. You should pursue something else. It's a great question. It's a really hard question. It took me a long time long time to learn how to deal with that, especially because I started my career in marketing and in product marketing where we define specifications. So a lot of times when we would do focus groups, especially with professional focus group agencies, I would feel under attack where my idea didn't get, you know, well, that, what, what that, that customer doesn't understand. Let's ask a question differently. And, you know, the professionals would say, no, no, no stop. Don't, don't bias the feedback. We want to hear this. What finally got me over this was when I realized that if they all agreed with the premises we laid out, we wasted our time. That the real win is where you find those points of dissension. And that's where the great stuff is. Because the stuff we put down, it's what's obvious. You know, the stuff that we have is what we think. And if all you're doing is telling me, yes, you're right, then all I'm getting is self-confirming you know, uh, validation. That doesn't help me. What I want to know is when I think this is what's going on, you say, no, that doesn't make any sense. Then you want to get to the next, why, why? I want to know what's behind that. But the mental thing that I had to switch was instead of rewarding myself for being right, I started mentally rewarding myself for asking the question away that we found out where we were not right. That the wins for us were collecting how many places did they disagree with us mm -hmm. as opposed to how many places they agreed with us. And it's a really important mental switch because those places that they disagree with you are where you get the enlightenment. The places where they 
agreed with you already, you've just wasted time. What did you need to do this for? If if everybody agreed, I've wasted my money on this. <laughs> yes. You know? And so that, but that was, it probably took me, because I'm a slow learner, 10 years of doing this before I realized this is the case. Because here's what happens. When you get more senior in those roles and you make those decisions and you start making decisions based on the self-confirmed, uh, uh, confirming bias, the marketplace is not all self-confirming uh, oriented. They are going to find your holes. And I prefer that I find the holes before the market finds the holes and shows that I was wrong. And so once I started getting more senior and then people started looking going, wait a second, how'd you miss that? It really did flip the switch for me to go, oh, you know what? I want to find as many negatives as and as many counter positions as possible because I may still decide to go with my original plan or my original feature, my original approach. But I can prepare, yes, I heard this, and here's why I didn't do it, or here's why we made this different decision. Um, and you will be surprised how often that has actually come back and helped. When we say, well, why did you price it this way? You know, Did you not know this would be a problem? And go, actually, we did. Here was the feedback we got. Here was the price position we, you know, uh, price feedback we heard. But here's why we decided to stick with it anyways. May not have been the right decision, but it wasn't because we didn't know. It was because we had these other factors and it was an executive decision we made. And usually that's a, okay, let's let's say that's okay or let's change the decision and move on. It's not like you missed it. And so, you know, the more warts you see yourself, the easier it is to plan and be able to plan to overcome them or to defend against them if they really do blast mm -hmm. up and cause a problem. It's interesting. Um... The I saw an ad for a travel jacket two weeks ago. And as you were talking about all of this, for some reason, the analogy of testing that jacket came into mind. So I'm going to walk you through something. Point me out if this is crappy or if this is a methodology that people use. Hypothetically, if uh, travel jackets um, are priced at $60 right now. And you mean the jackets with all the pockets for stuff? Yes, exactly. And uh, that's where it's going. And I... And I use it, and I think these suck. I could make a better one, but it will cost me 120 bucks. I go to a place where there's a lot of travel travelers or my customers where they congregate, and I start asking them questions. If I ask that question, do you want a better travel jacket? Their answer will be yes, and it won't be useful at all. Instead, if I could ask questions like, Okay, how many back po pockets are in your travel jacket? Is it cold? Is it warm? Um, how often do you use it? Do you pack it somewhere? Um, would you pay... Do you think these features, which I might have in my head, do you think these features are valuable and would you pay 150 for it? Yeah. If the answer is yes, I'm like, oh my God. Or the answer is no, then I'm like, okay, maybe people, my market doesn't want this. Then I go down to 120. Yeah. And that's how I start thinking about a product. Yeah, that's one way to, that's, that's definitely a valid approach. There's another approach which goes in the same way, but it starts the other way. It comes from the other direction. You have this jacket that you know that's $60. It's, it's a version of conjoint analysis. How much more will you pay or how much less will you pay for this feature coming out? Here's this jacket for 160. It has 10 pockets and a zipper and uh, costs $60. Here's a proposed jacket that here's the differences. It's got 20 pockets. Would you pay $120? No. Would you pay $110? No. Would you pay $100? No. Would you pay 90? Oh, how many pockets? I got double the pockets, got 20 pockets. Yeah, I'd probably pay 90. First data point, you got a $30 difference right there. Okay, now it's got this removable lining. This one doesn't, which means you can use it cold or hot. Would you pay $90 for this? Oh, absolutely. Would you pay $100 for this? And you could actually test against those two very quickly. And if you had 20 people, you would start to get enough data points that you could collect. You could actually start doing real statistical analysis to set the price point and the features you need it. Mm -hmm. and, and you can play, you know, then this is really what you do when people go, what do you do for all that time with this research? You can go back and do things like, okay, how many pockets? What are the, the variable pricing points and the feature points where we can get to the target price point we want? What do we have to have? What do we have to justify? What resonated, what didn't? Let's start with the conjoint looking at pricing and features. Then let's look at features and start adding and removing features to see how high we can get. You take those two analysis together, even if you're there for a week, you will be surprised how clear the data is when you look at it. You can look at that and go, you know what? We have to have at least 15 pockets. It has to be 
this price, we need, we absolutely have to have the feature of removable because we can't get enough differentiation without it. You will really see that kind of feedback if you do what you said. That's a great way to do it because you were kind of narrowing down the attributes that might be. Yeah. Well, and you're giving them something to compare against. This yes. is no different. You see this in advertising when you see one car versus another car and they go, well, how much would you pay for that? And even inside a brand, they'll show you different models of the cars and then you'll see the prices that are separate. Well, all of those are, to get to those things, they do this kind of research. How much more would you pay for you know, having a uh, turbo? How much more? Those are all done by conjoint analysis. And you know, you know, really that's how you would do it. So one, if I do that kind of analysis, one reason I see myself failing is if I've talked to 20 people and I've done this analysis about pockets and temperature and like, zips or whatever and if i've come across with different answers could it be and nothing's um there's no trend or there might be a trend could i be screwing up if i haven't realized that out of those 20 people there are three different kind of customers who care about very different things and now i'm maybe i'm seeing a trend that doesn't really exist in the sub market that i want to serve because i didn't understand my sub market yeah definitely that can be an issue so usually if you see this and you see that the the uh, the factors are fairly even across. There's not anything that stands out. Uh, to me, usually what I look for is one of two things. First of all, is my sample set so disparate, so different that there's nothing standing out? You know, like, again, I'll go back to the ice cream example. If I talk to the father, I talk to a college student, I talk to the bike messenger, I talk to all these people and they have nothing in common, to expect that you're gonna see a clear trend is unrealistic. So what first thing it tells me is my sample, you know, the, the, the population we've looked at and the sample within the population is so diverse that there's not a consistent group we're, we're um, talking to. That's the first thing. The second piece that I would say is if you're not seeing some differences, it means you have, in my concern would be you have too many things you're asking with not enough variation between the choices. To, so you may have asked about pockets, about liner, about price, and maybe for that size sample set, you should really only focus on pockets and ask 10 questions about pockets to see the differences in the views and pockets, as opposed to you've asked one question on pockets, one question on liners. So it's usually one of two things. Either your population is wrong, or not wrong, but it's too diverse, mm -hmm or your questions are too diverse. You're asking too many things that people are giving you high level answers without enough striation to really see trends between them. So, you know, for example, if, if let's say we decided we were gonna go interview 50 parents that came into the store, and we're gonna say parents, right? But we asked them about ice cream, we asked them about sodas, we asked them about the cookies, we asked them about their uh, purchase experience, their wait time. Um, you may get to see some things but I can't make a cookie decision based on that or a sandwich <laughs> decision because I've asked them too many questions that are not related. So if I really want to ask them about product preferences, I would want to spend that time and ask 20 questions or 10 questions about products. You know, what kind of cookies is vegan important? Um, you know, how important is it? You know, how much ice cream is, do you want more ice cream, less ice cream? Ask those questions. If you had 50 parents, you're going to see is price for the cookie important? What's the maximum price? What's the minimum price? You know, what, at what minimum price do you think that this must be crap food? You know, you will see enough variation that you can make some decisions. But again, if you go back and I, that same 50 uh, customer audience, if I asked about the whole experience, you're not likely to get enough information to make a good product decision. Mm -hmm. And that goes back to what you were saying about understanding the entire process of the customer need. Like if you're starting to a business, what's their buying cycle? Um, how many managers have to make that decision to buy? Um, how much does it cost? What's their budget like? What's their allocation for new software? Are they technology advanced? Right, right. Well, and here's the other reason that you want to know that. You want to be able to characterize these people well enough so that when you get outliers in your research, you can understand, did, they, did that outlier fit into the real population? Or was there something different? If they're real, okay, why are they real? If not, they really, it, this wasn't a parent, this actually was a college student. Throw it out. Don't let it influence your decision because you realize because you know the customers or the, 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 the sample that you're looking at, throw it out because it's actually an outlier. It's not really 
representative of an outlier of the data. It's an outlier of the sample. Does that make sense? Yeah, it does. When I do this stuff, I really try to understand the, the audience, the questions I'm trying to answer, and really who it is I'm talking to and what I'm trying to understand. So, and it sounds like, oh, that's a lot. It really isn't. It sounds way harder. It's like, if I'm gonna ask about ice cream and I'm gonna ask college students, I'm gonna pay attention. Does this college student really represent what I wanna ask? Do I really, do I really know that college student? Um, and that's where I spend my time on. And it may be that I look at you and you come in and you go, yes, I'm a college student, you know, to do a survey. And I go, you don't look like a college student. Well, I'm going to ask a lot of questions because not because I don't believe you're not a college student, but because I want to be able to characterize you different. You may represent a different type of college student I didn't know about. It doesn't have anything to do with my cookie question or whatever, but that's really meaningful for me to understand my customers. I can't tell you how many times I've gone, well, I know this is what you say doctors are, but did you know I've talked to two people that do this and they fit our criteria of doctors and they're not anything like what we've interviewed. There's a whole thing over here where they have different motivators and interests. We got to go look at them too. And that's a really important thing, but it had nothing to do with my product. It's because I understand by the time I'm done, that customer set. So hypothetically, again, for some reason, I, I'm on a roll yeah. with the Nazis. <laughs> That's <laughs> Friday. Funny. I don't know. Yeah. Um, talking about like maybe finding new customers. Um, if you do a pop-up store with ice cream sandwiches and you go in front of a park and parents buy ice cream sandwiches and you're like, oh, this is a great market. And for some reason you discover and you put a pop-up store somewhere else and there's like five drunk college kids who walk up to you at 1 a.m. For some reason, we have a pop-up store at 1 a.m. or you're bored or whatever, um, and they buy, and then 10 more people come, and 15 more people come, and that's a new market for you. Is that kind of what it is? I don't know if I'd consider a new market. I consider understanding mm -hmm. that there are drunk college students that actually like eating ice cream sandwiches at night, and that would be something I would go test because yeah. that absolutely could be. And not to give uh, any shout outs to a competition, but there's actually an, a chain called Insomnia Cookies yeah. that has figured exactly that out. And there's 150 ish uh, stores around colleges and their things are like the six pack of cookie. They're all named after you know, giving cookies for college students at night that have the, <laughs> the munchies. Yeah. So and it, it's a whole thread. They've, yeah, yeah, yeah. you know, a whole market segment they figured out. So yeah, that is absolutely powerful to know. You wouldn't go, oh yeah, that's the segment. You go, there's a new set of, a new segment of the customer set that I want to go validate. Because if I had five showing up and then I had another 10 showing up, that tells me there's something happening there. It was five one time and I never saw that again. I go, yeah, that was an outlier. But if I start seeing a few of them, it's like, there's something here because we're getting this activity without any work. Is that a real segment? If so, would a little bit of work make this a very successful business? So if I come in with an idea right now and I say, okay, um, this is my product, this is my customer. Um, because I worked in this place for 25 years and I think I know the customer, but it's kind of a new technology. I'm gonna put my money in right now. And I don't, I don't wanna do the customer validation. Why, how would you convince me to take a breath, take maybe three months and research more? Uh, well, first of all, I tell you, you can't have any of my money <laughs> <laughs> until you show me, you know, some data. Yeah. Um, let me, let me do a twist on your question. Yeah. Cause I think it's a good, a good thing. Let's say you've been doing this for, let's stay with your, your coats mm -hmm. just so we can have a real one. So let's say you've worked in a store that deals with in a department store for 25 years. You sold tons of these traveler jackets. You know what your idea is and you think you know the travelers. My first thing if I were you would I would go talk to other people that have sold travel jackets for a while and go, I believe this is the customer for this. Do you guys think there's anybody else I'm missing? And get a couple points. They may go, nope, you got it all. Okay, go look. They may go, wait, 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 have you thought about these people? Because I've sold these to these and you collect other feedback. And the goal would be before I even go do my first data collection, go talk to other people that have that kind of experience and go, do you think I'm missing any segments here? Who else can we go after? And once you've identified the two to three, you can't do 10, but say the two or three segments you want to go after, then you go do your research, making sure that you're talking to the three sets. One may be one you think is totally dumb. But if you've heard from somebody that I think that's a real segment, go test it and prove that you're that it's dumb or 
convince yourself they were right and god how did i miss that those are all for me the most fun ones it's like oh wow i never even knew that one existed that's how i would do it if i were you and here's the other thing to be careful about though with this and then i think you know you started to touch on the um it goes back to the qualitative and then the quantitative if someone comes to me and says i've talked to the customers and i really understand this product in this segment and this is the number my first thing I try to do is test to figure if it was anecdotal feedback. How many customers did you talk to? 20. Okay, how did you talk to them? Well, I went around and just interviewed them. Okay, did you give them a survey? Did you give them anything to have some consistency what you asked? No, but I've interviewed them all. My, my confidence factor starts to go down. What I wanna know is that you use this um, qualitative research to actually get to a set that's representative. It may be that you still did it all qualitatively, but if you told me, look, I've talked to 100 customers over the last two months using generally the same set of questions and I feel pretty confident, you know, my confidence starts to go back up. I'd love to see that you had a qualitative study or a conjoint analysis, on, super. But if you told me that you've done 150, you know, over three months and this is consistently what you're hearing, it starts to go up. I want to see not just, yeah, I've talked to four customers and this is what they say. My uncle Harold, two of his friends and people we know, that's, that's anecdotal feedback. That's, I want to be able to take the feedback you've given me. If you told me 150 and I don't believe you totally, I would actually be able to go after that, figure out what you said and create a survey and go test against it and replicate it with a quantitative analysis. That's to me uh, the right way to go do it. You know, the, the interesting way to, to do it. So what's that last jump off the cliff when, cause there's the infinite cost to infinitely perfect information. What's that jump where you can say, okay, I know enough at this point. The split between when do I go to a true quantitative analysis or not is dependent on your needs for outside support and help. But I don't say just funding. Funding's a big one. You may need to go do that because you really want to raise money and your investors are going to want to more, know more than your anecdotal. If you can say, I've talked to 150 customers and I ran a survey, here's my qualitative and my quantitative feedback and they support each other, that's an external driver that's going to do that. Could be that your employees may need you or people in your, your founder, if you're not a senior person, you need to convince them that you're right. The quantitative helps. Like for example, for me at Dell, I needed to do quantitative because even though I was the head of worldwide marketing for notebooks, for example, I couldn't say I'm the head of worldwide notebooks, you do that or else. I had peers all over the world that also were the head of notebooks for their region. I had the product group but they, I couldn't just tell them I've done the reach, I've done the analysis. They go, they're, they're all marketing people, they're smart. They go, show me the data. So as an influencer, you may need the quantitative to support your qualitative work. It isn't looking for the perfect data, it's figuring out what the levers are you're trying to pull. And for me, it's when you have to you know, influence, uh, get external factors influenced. For Motion, it was my supplier. We were asking them to do, my partner and supplier that did these products, we were asking them to do stuff that had never been done. And they said, show us that when we do this, that there's a market for these products. There wasn't, they didn't believe us, you know, but they needed their own validation. They could go back, you know, to their management and go, look, they've done the research. It's worth us taking the risk of building these products. So to me, it's important to have those tools to be able to also get people on board. Where you can convince other people, maybe it's time to take the jump. Right. Whether it's employees, suppliers, investors, or whatever. And you can do it with confidence. I mean, that's the other part is what, what I find for me is the more quanti uh, quantitative validation I get, the more I'm much more comfortable about taking hard positions of, look, I did the research. I've talked to the customers. I understand them well. And here's the quantitative data. And be careful if you ever do this, that you don't go to the same customers because otherwise it's just replicating it in a <laughs> in a different format it's not you know as valid so this is fantastic so. honestly i think most business and product success start from people understanding how to do this and it you don't have to do it hardcore expensive you literally can interview people on your own do a qualtrics or a survey monkey survey get friends to get you email addresses and all that. And you can do this very cost effectively and collect data and do this. This does not have to be an expensive or really time consuming thing. It, it needs to be, if you want to do this right, you got, it just has to become part of your DNA. 
You know, to me, the harder the conversation, the riskier the question is, the more I want to get some research behind it. Mm-hmm. That's just been my my experience. Cool. This was like I I love the fact that we jumped between analogies all the time. Ice cream, <laughs> yeah. healthcare, and jackets. <laughs> yes, they work. <laughs> you know, they should. And it, and that's the way it should be. It should be. You know, these are applicable all over. Oh, that's true. Because every like business is a risk, and you need data to support support your decisions, yeah. especially if you're trying something new. Yeah, the more unknown it is, the more you got to do the work of the research. You know, that's not even just product market fit; that's validation of a need. You know, so those are those are even harder to do. So, all right, thank you so much. Right. David. No problem. Happy to do it. See you. Back up. <laughs>